Father, as we come to you now to open your word, we pray that you may grant us hearts of solemnity, that we may realize that we are opening your word, and that your word is alive, your word cuts, your word shapes, your word edifies, and your word calls men to repentance. We pray that you may prepare our hearts, that our hearts may receive your word now, and their hearts may obey what we hear. Lord, we know that whenever we hear your word, we are not left unchanged. For your word will either encourage us in our walk in sanctification or remind us of our need to repent before you of our sin. And so we pray this morning, as your word is preached, that you may speak to, speak to both hearers and speaker alike. May all be saved, redound to your honor and to your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name, for his sake alone. Amen. <clears throat> this morning we have a sermon before us titled Elements of the Gospel. And I'm going to be going to various texts as I preach the sermon. And I trust that as we engage with what we will hear this morning, they will think seriously about how these words impact our lives. How the words that we will speak to you, and particularly how the words of the text that we quote will impact your life. If it doesn't impact your life, then we're wasting our time. But we know that God's word will not return to him void, it will accomplish that to which it has been sent. And so this morning, as we consider certain elements of the gospel, and I will explain that to you, to, to you very shortly, I trust that we will be edified, challenged, and encouraged. There's a phrase that we use today which is used without thinking. We say no news is good news. It may interest you to know that that phrase is said to have been coined by King James I. King James I, as we know, is who authorized the King James Version. So something he did in the 16th, 1660 still stands today. Many of you still have the King James Version in your, in your hands. But many of you also use this phrase, no news is good news. And we know what it means. But when it comes to salvation, no news is not good news. In fact, in this case, no news would be deadly. The English word gospel translates a Greek word that means good news news. And you've all heard that phrase, the good news of the gospel. Some of you may even have a good news Bible. But we know that when this word is used, the good news, it refers to the gospel. And this is news about God's dealings with man and sin and how to receive eternal life. So rather than thinking of the gospel as bad news that you'd rather not hear, it is essential to hear the good news that it carries if you want to have an understanding of salvation. There is a sense in which the gospel does have bad news attached to it, and we'll unpack that a little bit later on. But essentially, the gospel is a good news that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. But it's much more than that. And so as you consider this good news, we are faced so often with the question, what is the gospel? And it's amazing if you, if you just Google that phrase, what is the gospel, the amount of information that pops at, at you, at you is, it's, uh, it's amazing. And so many people have tried to define that very short phrase, what is the gospel? Here are some definitions that you will hear. The word gospel means good news. It's the good news message 
that mankind can be saved from the penalty of their sin and receive eternal life in heaven with God through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is absolutely that, but so much more. There's another quote. The gospel is the news that Jesus Christ, the righteous one, died for our sins and rose again, eternally triumphant over all his enemies, so, so that there is now no condemnation for those who believe, but only everlasting joy. Added a bit more to that definition, and again, totally true. So as we see these definitions kind of growing up, or growing, expanding out as, as mantra and in, embrace what the gospel is and reduce it to a definition, it's, it's hard. The gospel is a vast subject. It includes complex doctrines, many of which continue to be the subject of heated debates today. We may think of the gospel as a simple message, and it is, but the doctrines that are all embedded in the gospel are complex. They have held men in debate for many, many years, with many not finding resolution to their disagreement. It's not the intention of the sermon to unpack the doctrines of the gospel in detail. I will leave that to a better time and men of greater understanding to do that. We will be touching on some of these things in this church as we go forward. We need to. We need to understand what is all embraced when we speak about the gospel. But I'm hoping that this sermon paves the way for such a study in the not-too-distant future, whereby we can explore the many aspects of the gospel with a view, not only getting more knowledge, but also that we are encouraged to be more holy. We tend to forget that the gospel is there to give us an understanding of what it means to be holy. The gospel is about Jesus Christ, who is the Holy Son of God. And the gospel, when it's preached and responded to, turns us from children of darkness into children of light, those who lived in sin, who now can be holy because he is holy. The gospel is more than just knowledge about Jesus and his death. It is, that it is there to encourage us to be more holy. Today we consider five elements of the gospel, which are the plan of the gospel, the particularity of the gospel. And in this sense, I'm using that word as it relates to something that is specific or unique about the gospel. Element number three, the payment provided by the gospel. Number four, the provision made by the gospel. And number five, the purpose of the gospel. Element number one. The plan of the gospel, or the gospel, begins with a plan. Many of you sitting here remember a musical, The Sound of Music. And in that musical, as the, as the children are being taught to sing, there's one song which was very popular with small children, Do Re Mi. And Do Re Mi says this as its opening lines. Let's start at the very beginning, a very good place. To start. I don't think that the writer of that song lies it has theological implications, but it has. To start at the beginning is the right place to start. And likewise, the gospel has a beginning. There's a point at which it started, and that is where we need to start this morning. The gospel does not begin at the empty tomb. Many may think that that's when things started happening. The gospel does not begin at the empty tomb, even though we are told he was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification, Romans chapter 4. The gospel does not begin at Calvary. Many think that that is all the gospel is about, just Calvary. It does not begin at Calvary, even though the word of the cross is the power of God to those who are being saved, 1 Corinthians 1. The gospel does not begin at the birth of Jesus. And so many want to keep it there. They want to know about the baby Jesus, the baby that was so attractive to them, and they want to be stuck in a perpetual Christmas story. The gospel does not begin at the birth of Jesus, even though he came to save his people from their sins. The gospel does not begin at Isaiah 53, and that is a tremendous chapter that unfolds 
the, 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 the crucifixion in tremendous detail. And we see in that the suffering servant and the death of a savior. But the gospel does not begin at Isaiah 53, even though it rightly claims that he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The gospel does not even begin in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. That's known as the proto eugelion the first gospel, where God declares, I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to Satan, and between your offspring and her offspring. He, that's Christ, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Even that is not the beginning of the gospel. The beginning of the gospel is not found in time, it's found in eternity. When there was no human being, when there was no created universe, when there was nothing except God and God alone. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, please. Ephesians chapter 1. And verse 3 reads like this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Verse 4 is pertinent. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Turn with the world, don't mind it, to Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, speaking again about the gospel. Therefore, says Paul, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus, before the ages began. So Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that it was before the foundation of the world, before there was any material creation. And, one, and 2 Timothy 1 tells us it was before the ages began, before there was any time that could be measured. So before creation, before time, the gospel was already in the mind and in the workings of the triune Godhead. The planning and inauguration of the gospel occurred outside of the reach of man or any other created being. Before the angels, before Adam, before the fall of man, God planned his work of salvation. And this truth that the gospel is totally the work of a triune God is at the core of the gospel. The gospel is too often focused on man. Too many sermons place man at the center of the gospel. There's a gospel that addresses man's needs. And so every person thinks that the world rotates around him, and that he or she has to have their needs met. And so often, gospels are prepared to meet men's needs. There is a need to be met, and that need is very specific when the gospel is addressed. Too many sermons consider man's needs, man's wants, what man wants to have happening in his life. And it's me, my, and I. Too many sermons place the center of the gospel at man's will and man's volition. As a man is the master of his destiny, as a man is able to decide whether he should allow Jesus into his life, as a man is able to make a decision while he's dead and in darkness and in sin to accept life and light and eternal life. Too many gospels, too many gospel messages focus on those things. Does the gospel include man? Yes, it does. The gospel has been written and spread for the benefit of men. The gospel identifies man's greatest problem. Sin. That's man's greatest problem, and only the gospel addresses that in a way which it can be, which it can be met and can be changed. The gospel identifies man's destiny without Christ, and that's hell. There's no other place. That's what the gospel addresses. 
not only what happens to you here and now, but what happens to you in the future. The gospel identifies man's greatest need, salvation. And without the preaching of the gospel, without the preaching of God's word, without the word of the cross, there's no way of coming to salvation. We have to come by the way of the word of the cross. The inclusion of man in the gospel story makes sense of the gospel story. But he's not the primary focus of the gospel story, even though he receives the benefits of the gospel. If man was the primary focus of the gospel, then the gospel would be an afterthought, a contingency. Why do I say that? Because if God had created man as he did and hadn't already had a plan for sin, it then means that the, when Adam actually sinned and God was not prepared, God would have, to, would have to say, oops, I better have a plan to fix this. And that borders on blasphemy because he had a plan. And he always had a plan. Even when Adam was created sinless and perfect, God had a plan of redemption. It's not an afterthought. It's not a contingency. It's not plan B to fix up a failed plan A. Plan A has always been the work of the cross. Always. Now, as we unpack the doctrines of the gospel, we can engage what that means and how we can understand it. And that's why I repeat the inv invitation again. Men come to the morning study and engage with these complex or so often called deep under the things of the gospel and we understand why the gospel is the only good news that anyone can have. But God didn't step in because he was caught of God. The gospel and all that it entails was part of the divine intention of the eternal sovereign God before the foundation of the world. The truth is, is that God planned every aspect of salvation in eternity past. Every aspect. A plan that incorporated the creation and fall of man, a plan that incorporated the incarnation, the vicarious death and the resurrection of the Son, a plan that incorporated the calling out from among both Jews and Gentiles, those who should be saved. God fine-tuned the gospel plan way before man was anywhere on the scene. This plan continues to, rem to remain a mystery in many ways to the human mind. But it is the only plan the scripture puts forth as the gospel. There is no other plan. This is God's plan and it is supreme because it has been provided by a sovereign, holy, righteous God. Let me give you four texts that will take us into eternity past and prove this point. This is the only plan. These verses are like climbing into a time machine and traveling backwards in time to a time when time never was. The love of God, essential to the gospel in eternity past. John chapter 17, verse 24, listen to these words. Father, this is the Lord Jesus Christ praying just before he goes to be crucified. He's praying in the garden. He's praying to his father on behalf of those who are his own. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. The love of the Father to the Son was evident before the foundation of the world, and it's on the basis of that love that the prayer in John 17 is hugely significant. He's praying for those who are his own. And he's not praying for those who are in the world. He's not praying for those who reject him. He's not praying for those who do not believe him. He's praying for those who have been drawn to him because the gospel that was planned in eternity past became effective in their lives. The recipients of the gospel identified in eternity past. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, I will read it to you again. If you have your finger there, you can see it, but I will read it to you again. Ephesians 1 verse 4, even as he chose us, those who are believers, even as he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Why? That we should be holy and blameless before him. That's the effect of the gospel. Make him, makes you holy and blameless before him because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to us. But this plan 
and the people who are, who's identified as the recipients of this plan, that identification is made before the foundation of the world. The cost of the gospel is established in eternity past. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, that's too cheap to pay for the price of his soul, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Listen to where this is contextualized. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. We can't escape the eternality of the gospel, its planning, its inauguration. And this is why we believe in doctrines such as predestination, election, because all that takes place in the life of a sinner when he's saved comes exclusively because of the work of God and the Holy Spirit in your life. No other reason. What about the promise of eternal life in eternity past? You may think, well, maybe that was only something in the temporal. Titus chapter 1 verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God who never lies promised when? At Calvary, at the tomb, at his birth, promised before the ages began. This is an inescapable truth embedded in scripture that the gospel that we proclaim, the salvation that it offers is solely the work of God. There's nothing you can do to change the gospel. Your hand is not in it, and neither is your mind until the Lord draws you to himself. What was planned in eternity was, however, brought to fruition in time. And that takes us to the second element, the particularity of the gospel. The particularity of the gospel can be seen in two things. The uniqueness, the exclusive features of the gospel can be seen in at least two things. The historicity of the cross of Christ and the uniqueness of the cross of Christ. For a moment, think about the, the historicity of the cross of Christ. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ was a real event in history. This is not a figment of our imagination. It's not something that took place in a myth. There was a real cross, a real hill, a real, a real crowd, a real hammer, real nails, and a real savior on the cross. There was a time in history when that happened. And many observed it. All those from Jerusalem who gathered around Golgotha that day came out to mock him and sneer at him. The Roman soldiers, the nation of Israel, whoever was in the city as a proselyte, Gentiles and Jews together around Calvary, around Golgotha, saying, come down and save yourself. It was a real event. And the people who were there, they remember that event. It was burned into their minds, and we'll see that shortly. It wasn't an accident of the times he lived in. This was no accident. It wasn't as though something took place that was insignificant. Jesus made a mistake. He overshot his hand, and he didn't realize how unpopular he was. The historicity of the cross is founded in the plan of God. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders, and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, no confusion, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and full knowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. This wasn't a case where the Roman army, the Roman authority, was able to just do with another criminal as they chose. Their hands were guided by God. Those who crucified and killed him, their hands 
were guided by God. Those who condemned him, those who cast a stare in his teeth, those who falsely accused him, that entire time around his crucifixion was guided by the hand of God, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. The historicity of the death of Jesus was determined by God. The place, the time, and means of his death being set by a sovereign, omniscient God. His death was put on public display for all Jerusalem to see. His crucifixion was noteworthy enough, burned in the minds and memories of people, for a short while at least. His crucifixion was noteworthy enough to lead Cleopas on the mayor's road to saying to Jesus himself, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem? who does not know the things that have happened the, there in these days. Things happen in Jerusalem of which they were all aware. And these disciples now downcast, now sorrowful, having seen the Lord and their master crucified, are affected badly by what took place in those days because it was a real thing. Their sorrow was real. Their anguish was real, giving evidence of a real act of history. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ was not only a historical event, it was uniquely different from every other crucifixion. Being nailed to the cross was not a unique death in and of itself. There's nothing unique about the cross. It was a common form of execution for common criminals. But that is a scandal of the, of the gospel. He was no common criminal. He is, was and is, the perfect holy God-man. Every other criminal died as payment for the evil he had done. But Jesus died precisely because he committed no sin, making him the uniquely perfect sacrifice for our sin. He wasn't crucified because he was a criminal, he died because he was the perfect sacrifice. And God controlled the entire process right until the time when he could say, it is finished. That brings us to a thinking about the third element, the payment provided by the gospel. The gospel or the good news of salvation, or in the gospel, uh, this good news of salvation, there are two parties that appear to be irreconcilable. And the gospel makes a way to reconcile these two irreconcilable, apparently irreconcilable parties. On the one hand, we have a holy, holy, holy God who dwells in light, who dwells in holiness, who is untouched by sin and contamination. A holy God. On the other hand, we have sinners, all of whom, without exception, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And there are these two parties that has a barrier of sin between them. The separation is so complete that it requires a divine act of compassion to break down the barrier of sin between God and man. That's what the gospel provides, the breaking down of the barrier. An act that has to be initiated executed and ratified by God and by God alone. An act that both includes the immeasurable love of a loving God and also the unmitigated wrath of a holy, just, and righteous God. Those have to be brought together in this act of salvation. For both needs to be met. These attributes of God, his loving nature, and his holy, just, righteous nature, these attributes of God are brought together in Psalm 89. Psalm 89 is written by a man called Ethan, who, according to 1 Kings, is second only in wisdom to Solomon. And in Psalm 89, verse 14, he says this about God. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. He brings those thoughts together in a way which just says it so succinctly. The reconciliation of God and man 
demanded a price to be paid. The payment of the gospel was the physical suffering and death of Jesus. It was a payment that required physical suffering at the hands of those who sought to murder him. We already have quoted from Acts chapter 2. He was unjustly subjected to physical beating. He endured the brutality of fists and thorns and nails. <clears throat> he endured suffering that we cannot even describe. But Isaiah captures it so well in Isaiah 53. <clears throat> but he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And Isaiah depicts and describes the deep suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah lays out for us clearly, without any uh, misunderstanding, the depths of the suffering that he went to. And yet that was not the only suffering that he endured so you and I could be beneficiaries of the gospel that was planned in eternity past. The payment of the gospel is also the spiritual agony of the Savior. After he had endured all that his human oppressors could impose on him, after he had endured the torture, the whipping, his back torn open by, by whipping, after he had had a brow, uh, his brow pierced by thorns, after he had gone through everything that he had gone through, after he was buffeted and bruised to the point where he had to have someone else carry his cross for him, after he endured all of that suffering, physical, physical suffering that was meted out by those who should have known better, after he did all that, the Lord Jesus faced the judgment for sin, it was due for us as he bore the wrath of God during three hours of palpable darkness. We do not know what happened in those three hours. In those three hours of darkness when all had been done to him that could be done to him, humanly speaking, God dealt with him. And in those three hours between the Father and the Son, who is now God, and the perfect sacrifice, sin was dealt with. Your sin and mine, dealt with in such a way that it can be permanently, permanently removed from us. The condemnation of it now and in the future glory, completely away from sin in every way we can think of it. But those two hours of darkness, he faced a holy, 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 just God so that he could become an offering for sin. That wrath should rightly have been directed at you and me. It was our sin that put him there. He died in our room, in our place. Our sin should have been the reason why God poured out his wrath on us. But the gospel provides an alternative, a divine alternative, that Jesus Christ died for you and for me as he faced his faced God on the cross of Calvary for our sin. Oh, to see the pain written on your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin. Every bitter thought, every evil deed, crowning your bloodstained brow. Nothing captures the depth of his suffering more than the cry. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When all else had been done to him, it was at that moment in time when his father forsook him. When his father forsook him because he had to provide a way that you and I could be reconciled to God. And so we find that Jesus Christ suffers on the cross of Calvary. As the gospel tells us about the provision for our salvation, how on the cross, he suffered, he bled, he died, and he paid the price that had to be paid, a price that he alone could pay. Sin demanded a price to be paid. And the good news is that the price was paid by Jesus, and the price was paid in full. 
as I think about his spiritual suffering, it was one of the things not able, not being able to really grasp that that made me decide never to see The Passion of the Cross. I've never seen that movie. And the reason I didn't see it, or didn't want to see it was, beside a number of other reasons, mainly that it was a depiction of one side of the gospel. The suffering that's depicted in the, in, in, in the movie, I would guess, is nowhere near the reality. But it was his physical suffering. But there's no way a movie can capture his spiritual suffering, which was between him and the Father in darkness. Nobody saw that. Nobody knew what was taking place. In fact, when he cried out, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani, they thought he was calling for a prophet. But in those three hours of darkness, that's when God dealt with him. And so I don't think we can ever reduce that to a movie, even to a song or a poem, not fully, for it was something between our Savior and his Father alone. So what about this gospel? We heard all of this about the gospel, but does it leave us with something? Is there a provision made in the gospel for us? Element number four, there is a provision made by the gospel. None of us goes to a shop, makes a payment for something, and then we walk away with nothing in our hand. None of us, if we receive a gift voucher, which someone else has paid, throws a voucher away without collecting the item already paid for. If something is paid for, and it's paid for in our favor, we will make sure that we get it in our hands. The provision of the gospel deals with this very thing, but on a far more serious level. This morning we have been given the facts of the gospel. Facts that are provided so that you can clearly see your standing before God. If at this point in time, you don't realize that you are a sinner before God and need God's intervention in your life, then I have failed to make it clear to you. And this gospel doesn't apply only to you if you are not saved. This gospel applies to me and others who are saved. And the gospel should never leave us unchanged. But if you've been given the facts this morning of the gospel, then you have to do something with those facts. These facts included that we stated God is perfectly holy. God is a holy God. And because God is holy, it's impossible for us to approach him because we need, to, we need to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And we have no iota of perfection in ourselves. Why? Because man is dead in sin. Romans tells us all have sinned. Ex nobody is excluded from that. Not from Adam, the last person to be born on this earth. All have sinned. That is why we need a Savior. And Jesus Christ is that Savior. This is what the gospel provides, a Savior. He declares of himself in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He's saying this, at the graveside of a man who's been dead for three days. And his family are saying to him, Lord, if only you came, he wouldn't have died. And he says this at the graveside of a friend, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. That's not a contradiction in terms. Whoever believes in me, Though we die, those of you, and I include myself in that issue, who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and have made him our, or rather we have confessed him as Lord, we believe he's rose, raised from the dead, those of us who are his, when we die, we continue to live because we've already received eternal life. Physical death is but a doorway into something far more glorious, a better life than we can ever have here. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Those who have eternal life, believes in him, and lives will never die an eternal death. 
For there is a death coming, which some of which you will have to die if you do not live in him. Not only do we have to recognize that God is holy and that we are sinners, but the gospel provides understanding that the penalty for sin is death. The penalty for sin is death. And a pardon has to be made. In gospel terms, the pardon is a price that had to be paid. Without that pardon being given to you and me, we cannot be reconciled to God. No matter how much we try, no matter how good a life you live, no matter how much good deeds you do, I'd like you to think of someone now who you consider to be the, the goodest person you know. I don't know how more to state that. Someone that you think is so good that God must let them into heaven. Think of the person that you think qualifies on the basis of their life and works to walk into heaven without Jesus Christ. And think about the worst person you can think of, the most horrendous sinner you can think of, the one who has done deeds that is almost unthinkable, and put them side by side. And through the lens of the gospel, there's no difference. Absolutely no difference. Because God sees the heart, and the heart is desperately wicked. Because of the darkness and sin of our hearts, whether you are Mother Teresa or Hitler, totally the same when it comes to sin. No difference. It's only the gospel which has had the penalty paid for sin by Jesus Christ that can set us free. God sets the value of the price, and the value is set too high for man to attain. Because God is perfectly holy, the value of the price is sinless perfection. Something that no man can attain. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 says this, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt. That means a payment had to be made in some form. It stood against us with its legal demands. This is set aside by your good works, by your many prayers, by reading the word, he set the side, nailing it to the cross. Without realizing the significance of what the gospel provides and seeing that it identifies you as incapable of paying the price for yourself, you will remain in the darkness that Colossians speaks about. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20 says this, For you were bought with a price. A price had to be paid. We, we cannot escape that fact. It's a fact that he is uh, embedded in God's word. And the price was the price of a life. And the only life that qualified as a price that was high enough to meet the cost was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ paid the price because Jesus Christ is sinless and perfect. That may sound so simplistic. and It's not. Think about this. He is without sin. Did he live in a perfect environment? Did he live cocooned from life? Did he live in a place and in a way which he was sheltered from things that affect other men? Absolutely not. The opposite is actually true. He was born to a poor family. He was born in a town which most people in Israel consider to be nothing. He was mocked. He was derided. He was hated. He was falsely accused. Many times he could have lost his temper. Many times he could have done something to defend himself. He said, I can call 10,000 angels. But he doesn't because he's sinless and perfect. And his only desire was to do the will of his father. Jesus Christ paid the price because Jesus is Christ is sinless and perfect. He is the perfect, unblemished lamb that takes away the sin of the world. John chapter 1, verse 29. The gospel also provides us not only with a price that's paid, but with an invitation to respond to the free offer of salvation that is death purchased. By hearing these truths about Jesus and the salvation he offers, and then walking away, doing nothing, without taking up an offer, 
He's like a man who gets a gift voucher, 26,000 rand voucher to buy a brand new Samsung Galaxy S24. And he takes it, rumbles it up, and throws it in the bin. He says, not good enough for me. I challenge you to find a man who does it. Okay, maybe you iPhone lovers will do that, but the rest of us won't. If you walk away from the message of the gospel and do not respond in the way you are called to respond by the gospel, then you are doing exactly that. You're taking something of immeasurable value, something that has implications for the future of your life, and you're frumbling it up in your hand, and you're throwing it into the bin, and saying it's not good enough for me. Knowledge about Jesus alone is not good enough. I know that many of you here, if not all of you, have a knowledge of Jesus. You have a belief about Jesus. You believe something about Jesus. Even if you believe he's just a myth, you believe something about Jesus. Nobody believes nothing about Jesus. Why do I say that? I challenge you to look anywhere, on any website, any library, and see if people can leave Jesus alone. They can't. It's impossible. He continues to invade their lives. Even though they kick and scream to resist him, even though they refuse to acknowledge him, even though they try to burn up books and tear up tracts, and they fight and fight and fight and say that we are stupid to believe in a mythical man or just a teacher, but they won't leave him alone. Jesus calls everyone's understanding to some level or another. But that knowledge in and of itself will not save you. Knowledge and approval that the gospel is true is not enough. Many people are religious people. Many people consider themselves to be spiritual. The term is, I'm a person of faith. You may be a person of faith, but if your faith is not placed in Jesus Christ, it's placed in a totally different other God. So, the knowledge about Jesus alone won't save you. The knowledge and approval of Jesus alone is not enough. You have to respond to the call of the gospel, a call that says Jesus has died for sin, paid the price demanded by a holy God. God is willing and able to forgive you for your sins based on the perfect work of his son. And the response that's required from you is recorded in Romans chapter 10 verse 9. It requires you to move on from a simple mental cerebral understanding to an active confession with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And a true and full belief in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, and you will be saved, says Paul to the Roman church. That is a crazy statement to make. It's made with full clarity. It's made with no maybes attached to it. It says that if you do that, confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, if you do that, which means you've engaged with the gospel to the extent that you recognize that you are a sinner, and that you repent of your sin, and that you come to him for salvation, as the only one who can save you, you will emphatically, without any doubt, be saved. If you did that, if you did that, you'd have cashed in the most important voucher you could ever receive, because God provides a promise of eternal life through the work of Jesus Christ. In 1789, Benjamin Franklin, in addressing uh, the, the new constitution of the republic, made this statement, which we say today. Again, these old statements just seem to hang around, these old idioms. In this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death. And one brother will forgive me and tax us. Nothing is in this world can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Is that entirely true? 
I believe there's something far more certain and far more permanent than both text, than both death and taxes. And that is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Received by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2. We've already quoted to you Romans chapter 10 verse 9. And verse 10 of that section says, that, that the text says, for with a heart one believes and is justified. Listen to the assurance of his words. Listen to the certainty of his words. Listen to the permanence that his words extend to those who confess him with their mouth and believe in their heart. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Will not be put to shame. That's the power of the cross. This is the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath, we stand forgiven at the cross. My final element of the five is the purpose of the gospel. And I take my cue from the last line of the hymn I just quoted. We stand forgiven at the cross. It's easy to see the purpose of the gospel as it expounds the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ as being a message directed at turning unbelievers to Christ. We keep thinking of the gospel as a message to those who need to be saved. That's why we give our tracts. That's why we speak in the open air. That's why we speak as we speak in this morning. Because those of you who are not saved need to be saved. And it's only by the preaching of the cross that you can be saved. So the gospel is clearly directed at those who need Jesus. But is it all the gospel does and is intended to do? The purpose of the gospel is to save and to sanctify. The purpose of the gospel is to both bring us to a point of salvation, justification, and then keep us on a walk of continued salvation, sanctification. Having been saved through the gospel, we now stand in the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. There was an act of commitment, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Hold it. Am I not saved already? Surely when I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart, I was saved. I've, you just you were saved. You just said, it happens. It's, it's, it's a given. Yes, you were saved. From the condemnation that sin has over you. But we still live in bodies that need to be sanctified. We are still prone to sin. And John tells us all about that in his epistles. I remind you, brothers, of the gospel of peace to you, which you receive, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. So it's clear from Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, that while once we are saved by the gospel, we continue to stand in the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, I quote one more time, to reinforce the, the truth that salvation is not a static position. It's a dynamic life lived for God in the power of the cross. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Those who are perishing, those who are not believers, those who are not saved, are in that state because the preaching of the cross is foolish to them. It's foolish to you. No matter what you may say about your attitude to the gospel and to the cross of Christ and to the work of the cross, unless you respond in repentance, the word of the cross is folly to you who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, I can't help but quote these verses to you because these verses, just as they are read, expounds the gospel in ways which we fail to be able to articulate. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So if you thought, well, maybe this is for the Jews only, this includes everybody. When the Bible says Jew and Greek, it includes everybody. It includes the Jews, whether, whether they are Eskenati Jews or not. It includes Jews or atheists or not. It includes all the Jews. It includes all the Greeks or the Gentiles. No matter where you are, everyone is included in that. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Brother and sister, the gospel is the means to salvation to those who are unsaved. And we know they come to the point of salvation only by faith through grace. No other way. Not by, the, not by the efforts, not by the works, not by the goodness. You and I have been there, so we know exactly what that means. You and I have been on the other side of salvation, right? You and I have been on that side, on the dark side. And now we are walking in light because of a work of salvation that was made available to us by grace through faith. That's why we are saved. But now as we walk standing on the gospel, we do so in faith. Faith does not become excluded from our lives once we have become saved. Too often we place the gospel under the banner, under, under the banner of evangelism. As of the only time that we use the gospel is to evangelize. This attitude results in believers having a truncated and a stagnant understanding of the gospel. As though now that we are saved, we no longer give attention to the word of the cross or the gospel of Jesus Christ. The purpose of the gospel is to both lead the believer from darkness into light, from death into life, as well as take the believer along a path of increasing sanctification, a deepening of our devotion to the Lord. Otherwise, how else would we stand or continue to be saved or live by faith? But even this standing, this continuing living by faith, is not the only purpose of the gospel. As much as that is an essential part of understanding the gospel goes on, it's not the only purpose of the gospel. The gospel's purpose is far greater and has a far greater end goal. I'm going to take the time to go back to Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to turn there and I'm going to show you what is the ultimate goal of the gospel. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he, the Father, chose us in him, the Lord Jesus Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, here it is, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, that's in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his world, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. It's all about God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Man does nothing in this. Verse 10, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are first to hope in Christ might be, what? To the praise of his glory. In him, in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The supreme and ultimate and magnificent purpose of the gospel is God's glory. God is glorified in all that the gospel encapsulates, including the horrendous death of his son, including his suffering and his chastisement at the hands of men, 
including facing his father on our behalf. All of that, his, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and all that he was and is, all of that is embedded in the gospel, which is a word which is preached to the praise of his glory. God's glory has to be maintained in the gospel. We started there, right? We started that the plan of the gospel resides with a glorious God in a time gone by, when time was not time. And we end up at the end of this sermon realizing that whether we, whether we begin with the gospel or end with the gospel, it's all to God's glory. The best way I can say this is perhaps in closing, just quoting Romans chapter 16, from verse 25. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for, a long, for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations. None is excusable. According to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith, verse 27, to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we feel totally inadequate to fully expound the richness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Words fail us, thoughts flee from us, our hearts grow anxious as we endeavor to just think about it, let alone speak about it. But we thank you for the truth, the reality, the permanence, and the glory of the gospel. For those who have obeyed the word of the cross now live in a new life that's offered freely to all who will come unto him in faith. We pray that this morning, Lord, today, you may work in the hearts of those who are not yours. Call them to yourself. Draw them. They may find eternal life. And those of us who name the name of Jesus, help us to walk in such a way that the gospel is magnified in our lives. We pray for this grace in Jesus' name and for his sake alone. Amen.